This evening we are going to discuss the last of our groups of polarities, and we've taken up the subject, the heart and mind. We often hear this term used, and we know that a very clear distinction between the powers of the heart and mind are to be found in the uh, sacred books of the Christian people and the Jewish people and also in the Oriental scriptures. In modern psychology, the trend has been to group the mental and emotional processes under one heading. I think, however, this will gradually have to be revised because we are actually dealing with two distinct patterns. And it is rather useful to the average person to be able to clarify the processes within himself which manifest the native powers of the heart and mind. Nearly all ancient peoples were of the united opinion that the seat of life of man is in the heart. As we go on down through time, we find this more or less supported, even on a scientific level. We know that while the heart continues to beat, man lives. When the heart ceases beating, he dies. We also recognize that some very wonderful energy is communicated to the heart by which this mysterious organ is sustained, often under extraordinarily difficult circumstances. Until the heart apparently is ready to die, it will not stop. And individuals have come through indescribable physical dangers and have survived. Others, for no reason at all, are cut down with practically no warning at all. As one of the older philosophers pointed out, the heart can stop any time after it has begun to beat. So we do not have too much insight as to the forces and conditions which regulate the heart. We know, however, that it is divisible into two essential structures. One of these is life maintaining, and the other is strangely and mysteriously sensitive to emotional circumstances around the person. There is the heart that lives and the heart that is hurt. The heart can be damaged both physically and psychically. The heart can actually break for all practical purposes, and persons can die of grief, perhaps not instantly, but in a relatively short period of time. Therefore, most of the deeper emotions of man react upon the heart, affecting its rhythms. And it is quite obvious that the more we endanger the heart's function by extraordinary stress, the more likely it is to be damaged. Thus the heart, while an amazingly powerful instrument in itself, can often be injured by very subtle and mysterious circumstances. The old Egyptians used the lotus flower of their country to represent the human heart. They also placed in each one of their temples an inner sanctuary, the Aditam, which they considered to be an inner place close to the heart of life. The heart of the temple was the most sacred place of worship. And it was usually a room set apart for meditation and prayer 
and the observances of the most advanced and important rituals of the religion. In India and other Asiatic countries, the lotus is also a heart symbol, and the various religious figures seated upon lotus flowers are heart-born. Uh, they are actually the productions of an alchemy which takes place in the heart of the mystic. In the, the early Christian faith, the heart was one of the most important symbols of Christ, and has also been associated very closely with the grief or sorrow of the mother of Jesus at the time of the crucifixion of her son. Therefore, the mother of sorrows is shown with one or more swords piercing her heart. Grief, therefore, is regarded as an emotion intimately associated with the heart, stabbing into it, uh, striking it a foul blow for which it has no defense. The scripture says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. We therefore can follow some of the mystic speculations relating to this most metaphysical or secret instrument in the body of man. There are many very interesting and curious physiological symbols related to this process. The development of the entire theory of the arterial and venous circulations as being the two trees that grow in the heart. The association between the heart and the Garden of Eden is therefore an early symbolism. There are many ways that we can extend this thinking, but for our practical purposes at the moment, we are particularly concerned with dividing the reflectors of man on certain levels with these important polarized concepts of the heart and mind. In Buddhism, for example, we have a series of levels or bodies of consciousness, which perhaps we can use uh, in symbolism of the heart and structure process of man. In Buddhism, the highest form of vestment, the highest existing structure or body of life is called the Dhammakaya. This is the body of the law itself. This is the tremendous dynamic of the universe. The Dhammakaya is the ultimate vestment of life, the most completely abstract that we can conceive. No individual can bestow upon it any particular form. It is a form of forms. It is a magnificent tapestry composed of all structures that exist. Perhaps the Egyptian had much the same thought of mind in mind when he created the likeness of the deity Serapis in the great Serapium at Alexandria. The Egyptians made this deity by combining all the known or existing structures of nature. They took all kinds of plants and flowers and trees, and they took small parts and fitted them together like a mosaic. Then they used all types of statuary and sculpturing of animals, birds, insects, every type of living thing, and fashioned all this imagery into the likeness of one great person, the weeping god Serapis. This type of symbolism perhaps has some relation to the Dharmakaya. At least it represents the ultimate vestment of eternal life. In this life vestment there is no lack of any energy, life principle. It is the total body. It is everything that exists as an eternal abstract one thing. There was no actual way in which the Buddhists could represent this in art, 
So they used the only symbolism they could. Uh, they used the device of increasing the size of an image to represent by its extraordinary majesty uh, this concept of the Dharmakaya. Well, I think we might say for our present purposes that this mysterious body that cannot be seen, cannot dimensionally be represented, might correspond to the aura or magnetic field of man. Here is actually the source of himself. We have to begin to realize that while man's body seems a rather compact structure, the life actually is not in the body. The life is in this Dharmakaya, or the over-totality, Emerson's over-self. The actual source of man's life and the true uh, fountainhead of the streams that pour into conditioned existence must be regarded as the auric egg or the auric field, the mysterious luminous sphere which encloses man. And in this, in this sphere we have all of the various energies operating. We have here the reservoirs of forces. Here we also have the mysterious magnetic polarities by means of which cosmic, planetary, and solar energies are drawn into the body. Here we have a very strange astronomy within man himself, as Paracelsus tells us. Now this magnetic field operating inwardly was corresponding in old times to the Ptolemaic concept of the universe, which was a concept in which the solar system was enclosed within a mysterious egg called the zodiac. And within this egg, uh, all energies were falling downward from the stars into the condition of uh, conditioned existence. So energies were falling like dew or rain from the circumference toward the center of this mysterious structure. In the old symbolism of the ancient Hindu mystics, life, therefore, was forever falling from this magnetic or auric field, and in descending fell towards a mysterious hypothetical center. And in the center of this field, or near the center, for it was not actually dead centered, there was this focal point, uh, which uh, apparently represented the area in which all these energies converged to form a kind of unit, or a compound unity. This center was the Samboda body the luminous golden body of the Buddha. This represented, therefore, the seat in man of the extraordinary benevolence represented essentially by the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. The Buddha himself initiated his disciples in what is called the Septapana Cave, a mysterious place of seven rooms. This place of seven rooms undoubtedly symbolized the human heart, within which the initiation of consciousness must take place. Hermes, describing the Great Pyramid to his son Tatian in the Hermetic Dialogues, declares the pyramid uh, to be a symbol of the heart. It was the center, or the most sacred of all places. The Rosicrucian rose with the heart in its center, and the crest of Martin Luther have the same meaning. The uh, Samboda body is luminous throughout. It is the body of purity, the body of light, uh, the body of great goodness. And when we study the Buddhist symbolism, we realize that the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas all represent beings that have essentially transcended mind, and this is an important point. Uh, the old scriptures point out definitely that Buddhas are beings that have transcended ideas, that the creation of processes of thought have ceased in them, that in, uh, in, the, in the place of these processes of thought there has come forth a universal apperception 
derived from immediate impact of reality upon life. So that this central core, the heart, the Samboda center, with its great mysterious radiance, is actually to be regarded as in man uh, the center of the transforming force of spiritual growth. This spiritual growth transformation in Buddhism is, of course, personified by beings who receive the golden complexion. And the beings with golden complexions are Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. This golden complexion means essentially that they are beings composed inwardly and substantially of light. That they are beings in whose nature all uh, inferior elements have been transmuted by the law, by the processes of consciousness. The Buddhists of old times, who were perhaps the most highly advanced specialists in this type of thinking, were always afraid of the mind. They regarded the mind as the uh, ancient Brahman did, as a potential deceiver unto the end. The heart, therefore, was simply the abode of goodness. And the heart of man is the seat in man of the pure emotion of love. And to the Buddhist, love was infinitely more important than intellect. Because love gave. Uh, love did not demand but bestowed. And it is interesting to note that in the Buddhist doctrine, there are certain emotions that evolve with the unfolding nature of the being. There are emotions which must die, emotions which belong only to levels of consciousness. But there are certain emotions that can grow, that can evolve, that can unfold with the unfolding being and attend that being to the very threshold of the infinite. And one of these emotions that grows, unfolds, matures, evolves, is love. Because in this emotion we have the individual achieving uh, the most benevolent, the most benign, the most charitable, the most compassionate, the most understanding, the most appreciative relationships with existence. Selfishness can never grow, but unselfishness can. And unselfishness grows up from selfishness as the lotus grows out of the muddy earth at the bottom of the pond. So all things that have within themselves this nature of becoming nearer to the real have the power to enlarge or progress or advance along the way of destiny. Nearly every emotion or power in man, which in mysticism is capable of attending the person as he ascends toward reality, nearly all of these belong to the heart pattern, not to the mind. So that the uh, actual concept in Buddhism, as expressed in the great mantra, Om Mani Padme Hum, simply means the jewel in the heart of the lotus, the symbol of reality enthroned in the great heart center in man. Now when we get down to the very prosaic forms of things, we realize therefore that the heart is not only a most important and wonderful structure, but in a mysterious way a very dangerous one. Nearly all errors of the mind can be more or less easily corrected. But the moment the individual goes against the heart, he is approaching a very dangerous situation in his own consciousness. To betray thought is bad. To betray the deeper spiritual conviction of man is the most terrible offense possible. And for the individual to betray his own heart 
is an almost unforgivable sin, although in Buddhism there are no actually unforgivable sins. But the greatest damage that the individual can do to himself is to pervert his own heart. This is the profaning of the temple. This is the sin against God. This is the action by which the person most immediately damages himself. So uh, we have in the great orders of European knight errantry the idea of the Holy Grail, which was another heart symbol. We have the knights of the Grail, like Galahad and uh, Percival. And uh, we know that it was said in the age of chivalry that these knights had the strength of many men because their hearts were pure. The dedication of life to the service of truth. The dedication of the mind to the service of the heart. That the mind shall be the champion of the heart was one of the highest dedications recognized in ancient times. If the uh, person psychologically commits a mental offense, he will be considerably injured by this. But if he profanes his uh, inner emotional life, he is going to be very, very sick very soon. Once this inner source of what might be termed the undefinable integrity in things, once this is damaged, the individual loses the mysterious power of spiritual equilibrium. Once this is no longer capable of guiding him, he has lost almost everything that is important to his own growth. Thus hearts become the symbol of truth. Uh, the error against truth is the most dangerous. The heart becomes the peculiar symbol of virtue. The act against virtue is very dangerous. The heart becomes the symbol of faith, and the loss of faith is one of the most terrible losses that man can suffer. The heart is the final source of creativity. It is the source of the supreme uh, resolution of man to be greater than he is, to improve, to grow, to unfold. These are not mental processes. These are deep impulses within his own psychic life. And where these are damaged, all else fails, where it does not matter how much man may seem to accomplish. If he has no faith in his heart, he is a failure, and there will be no way of preventing him from ultimately falling into the most serious difficulties. Thus the heart is the censor. It is the guardian. It is that which constantly warns, constantly admonishes. It is the source of the deepest, and therefore it perverted, the most tragic circumstances in life. The uh, mystic has always held the importance, therefore, of achieving unity with the heart, to make the heart directly available to the conscious needs of the person. The heart is of course, so physically an organ, but psychologically a great organism. Uh, the heart is just as capable of a very complicated function as the mind is, but the function is entirely different. The function is one of pure spiritual intuition. It is a process in which Knowing comes from the heart, thinking comes from the mind. Somewhere within the depths of the heart also is the eternal record of man. In the heart center, the contact between the present embodiment of the individual and the karmic pattern of his existence is placed in the heart pattern. Therefore, it is through the heart that Direct experience comes to man. Experience which is not the result of 
conjecture, interpretation, application. It is the simple dynamic of the acceptance of a thing totally by impact. In children, the heart power is very strong. That is the reason why the child responds uh, with such extraordinary intuition uh, to the situations around it in life. That is why it is very difficult to deceive a child. Uh, in order to be deceived, we have to set in motion various intellectual structures. But the child only knows happiness and unhappiness, security, insecurity, love and lack of love. Uh, these are the great impacts. And if the child experiences love within itself, as bestowed by its parents, there is a security established in that child, which is the secret of a future happiness in life. So that life itself is related to love. It is related to the instinctive acceptance of value. Uh, the small child having a pet of some kind, a little animal, a kitten or a puppy, uh, this child bestows a tremendous emotional wealth upon this object of its simple affection. It expects nothing from this creature, this little animal, except its existence. And the child finds a great warm rejoicing in this association with life. And as the child becomes a little more mature, the child experiences another tremendous privilege, the privilege of protecting something that is less able than man to protect itself. Therefore, protectiveness arises. Sympathy is strengthened. Affections are warmed and quickened. And the individual experiences nearness, finding in this life, which it uh, perhaps holds in its arms as a small animal, feels the nearness of all life. This little creature becomes a life symbol experienced as a life truth by the child. Where young people are therefore deprived of these instincts, we begin to set in them a pattern which is dangerous to their own happiness and well-being. Now if we study the heart of man uh, through a polygraph, or some instrument of that kind. Uh, electrocardiograph will do part of it, but other uh, equipment helps on a good many occasions. We begin to see how quickly the heart responds, even in a so-called immature person, an undeveloped person, how quickly and dramatically it responds to practically every type of emotional uh, pressure. We find, as the Chinese learned, that there is not a mood, not a thought, not an attitude, not an experience, not a word read from a book, not a headline in the paper, not a moment's viewing on television, not a second in the consideration of a play, in which the circumstances taken in through the eyes or taken in through any other active sensory perception, hearing, touching, tasting, all of these immediately react upon the heart. Not only is the heart therefore quickened or slowed by almost any phenomena with which it is confronted through the sensory perceptions, but there is possibility of determining whether this change is for the better or for the worse we do discover that that which disturbs the heart is usually something in itself undesirable. The heart is not uh, evilly affected by that which is good, that which is beautiful. The individual listening to great music is not as likely to damage the heart as an individual listening to an extreme, broken, sophisticated syncopation of some kind. The, the reaction upon the heart from all outside stimuli 
may be considered almost instantaneous. Uh, the Chinese physician, it is said, had reached a degree whereby placing his finger upon a pulse, a hand, the patient's a hand, passed through an opening in a curtain so that the doctor can see nothing but the wrist and the person wearing a glove. That the physician is able almost completely to tell every thought that moves in the mind of that person. This is another important situation. The individual himself is constantly causing various irregularities in the delicate mechanism of the heart. Now some people feel that there's nothing that's better for the heart than a lot of vigorous exercise which it can gain, for instance, through a temper fit. But actual facts indicate that this is not as happy a, suspect, uh, a suggestion as is suspected. Every destructive mood of the individual is immediately recorded in the heart. Uh, hate, envy, greed, fear, doubt, worry, all of these affect the heart. Now it's, it's often hard to determine how much damage is actually done. In fact, in our way of life, there is almost no way of knowing. For unless the damage is great enough uh, to, indicate, to reveal a serious injury to the heart, we are almost unable to tell, for example, what the facts may be. We know a person who has poor self-control. This individual lives to a good 75 or 78 years of age apparently not seriously damaged. We will never know how long that person would have lived, however, had they not subjected themselves to this tension. One day we know beyond doubt, no one lives as long as they should. Man at the present time, with the construction and time and growth periods and the body which he possesses, should live a minimum of 150 to 200 years. Some way he is committing suicide. Of course, there are many things that can cut him down. But assuming that he survives all artificial hazards in nature around him, there is very definite possibility that every uh, moment of bad emotional attitude which he indulges is taking something from his life expectancy. He doesn't realize this because the heart, after the passing of this emotional stress, may settle down again to its old work of pumping. But damage is done whenever a delicate instrument is subjected to stress for which it was not basically intended. It is true that through heredity, through ages, man has become gradually accustomed to stress much more, perhaps, than he realizes. But though, even though he may become accustomed to it, even though he may endure it, there is no indication whatever that he's any better for it. What actually seems to happen is that he is subjected to a gradual destruction of psychic function, that uh, the heart is hurt. It is injured in some way perhaps so slightly that our instruments cannot reveal it. But there is some reason why people have been dropping dead in their forties in this period of exceptional stress. There is some reason why, for example, in Japan, in the last twenty years, the length of life has been extended for nearly twenty years. The life expectancy of the normal Japanese person today is about 68 to 69 years for the male and about 71 years for the female. And this is very good considering that it is a tremendous step over previous conditions. Uh, in the old times, the great enemy in, the, in Japan uh, was tuberculosis and pneumonia, where these were the enemies, due to the fact that the standard of nutrition was not adequate. Gradually, these have been overcome. In the 20 years, however, since the war, 
new ailments have continually begun to appear in Japan. Ailments which were not present prior uh, to the industrialization, modernization, and competitive economic structure of modern Japan. In the last ten years, the great killers of Japan have become heart trouble, arteriosclerosis, and cancer. All of them comparatively negligible until the Japanese took on our way of life. Now, there's something possibly in this worthy of a little further consideration. It seems to mean that as far as the heart is concerned, and uh, uh, the, that a way of life does certain things, that, and these things hurt people. What are, what are the things that are hurting us today? They are mostly heart hurts. They are disillusionment. The sudden realization that things that we have believed are not working out. Fear. Doubts concerning the future. The fear of a possible nuclear war. The fear of a gradual eruption of violence all over the earth. The loss of faith. Our faiths as individuals have not been maintained. There are a few thoughtful persons whose faith has been, has been strengthened, but for the most part, faith has been weakened throughout our entire civilization by our way of life. Another definite attitude that has been very serious is the rapid increasing selfishness of the individual. The constant self-centeredness and the loss of the great heart virtues of compassion humility, unselfishness, kindness, and mutual affection. I think we can say safely that these heart virtues at this time are at a very low ebb. And with this loss, we are beginning to experience the rapid rise of ailments, which we have always had because there were always selfish, self-centered people with us but never to the tremendous degree that they threaten us today. The heart having lost leadership in the basic affairs of men means that kindness has lost leadership in our private uh, activities. The loss of kindliness, the loss of gentleness, the loss of integrities, uh, these losses add to our fear, disturb our rest interfere with our relaxation. And under the pressure of competition, which is merely a non-militant war, uh, we are again under tremendous psychic stress. All this stress batters into the heart. And someday we probably will have to follow the very ancient Chinese medical theory. And it was a very simple theory. And that is that we must center all attention upon making the human heart as an organ happy. This was one of the secrets of the great medical works of the Yellow Emperor, one of the earliest of all the Chinese physicians. The heart is the source of all diagnosis, and every other part of the body is merely a symbol of the heart in operation. The uh, Oriental mystic, the Christian mystic, found, therefore, the sovereign importance of the peaceful heart. He realized that his entire ability uh, to be a truly great person rested in the tranquility of his inner life. The tranquility of the heart is the most important ingredient in the perfect balance of the human being. If his heart is tranquil, if he has found ways to reduce the intensities that destroy the peace of the heart, then he is not only going to 
increase his length of life probabilities, but he is also going to enjoy the expression of creativity in himself. The individual whose heart is not at rest locks himself away from his own source of life. He locks, locks himself away from his own power to create, to release. He builds a barrier between himself and the sovereignty of truth in himself. And this sovereignty of truth can only be experienced when the heart is free from pressure. Now, nature is able and perfectly willing, apparently, uh, to make certain adjustments. It is not assumed that the individual will be always completely calm, completely poised, and completely in possession of his emotions. But he must be in a state of poise, a state of relaxation, and a state of inward peace at least a large part of the time. Nature can take care of emergencies, but cannot combat one perpetual emergency which never ceases. So that uh, nature can provide means to defend the individual from real pressures and great disasters which he must face. But nature cannot cope with a life that is a continuous disaster. So that uh, this is the realization actually that the heart is the most precious thing we possess and everything that injures the heart is an injury which we cannot afford everything that causes this organ to miss a beat to speed up too dramatically to slow down too much anything which disturbs the drumbeat of Shiva is dangerous. Now the Hindus also point out that there are no two human beings whose heart action is identical. Now, this is probably something that Western medicine will have to work with for a little while yet before it has even the means of determining these differences. But in the philosophies of the East, it is assumed as a basis that the heart rhythm is a very peculiar thing. It is like the American Indian song of life and song of death. The rhythm of man's heart sings or plays a strange and wonderful melody. This melody is unique. And as Pythagoras pointed out, every structure in nature has a keynote. And this keynote is the secret of its strength and also the secret of its weakness. Therefore, the human heart does have a certain unique individuality. And this individuality results from the fact that it is the sum of the degree of enlightenment and the degree of ignorance existing in each individual. The heart is therefore a kind of mystical thermometer that reveals how far the total person has gone on the journey of existence. This means that theoretically, through certain yogic processes, the rhythm of the heart can be influenced. It means also uh, that there are ways in which the heart can be speeded or slowed artificially, entirely apart now from medical procedure. That there are various uh, patterns of control which form one of the esoteric arts of antiquity. The theory being that the individual could be improved by changing the heart rhythm. Now this, of course, is a kind of a subtle materialism. It is something which can be very dangerous. We can assume that under certain types of hypnosis, the rhythm of the heart can be affected. But if this occurs, and this uh, break or false 
polarization of rhythms endures for any length of time, the new rhythm will come in direct conflict with the complete structure that it has built up upon a previous rhythm. Thus, to change the heart by artificial means is very likely to destroy the life, destroy the health and body integration of the person, and perhaps to result in serious mental or emotional disease. On the other hand, all natural growth attained by the individual also changes naturally and properly the heart rhythm. The heart thus becomes the means by which man's aspirations are transformed into processes for the sustaining of the physical structure of his body. And every part of man's superphysical life is either building up or tearing down his physical structure. And the agent of the process is the heartbeat. Also, according to the old thinking on this problem, every record that we have in life is recorded in the heart. If the individual in the old story uh, falls into the mill pond or goes out too far and at the beach and is picked up by a great wave and comes near to drowning, he very often has the experience of seeing his life pass rapidly before him, usually in a reverse panorama. Uh, that is, beginning with the last episode and moving backward. Under hypnosis also we have available an almost perfect record of everything that has happened to the person from the beginning of life. In the esoteric philosophies it is assumed that this record is the result of the circulation of the blood carrying the complete account of the emotional pattern of the person and passing it through the heart where it sort of forms a continuing record that remains. Uh, as the uh, uh, Hindus realize, the final removal of this record at death results in the transmission of the record through one of the branches of the vagus nerve up through the crown of the head and into the magnetic or auric field. But every part of man is recorded there. And the human heart is a tremendous symbolic, mystical structure about which a great deal can be said. But for all intent and purpose, for practical reasons and considerations, we may say that the heart is intimately associated with the operation of cause and effect in the individual. It is an instrument that cannot be deceived. It is an instrument that can sit forever like Osiris in judgment. And you will remember that in the weighing of the soul in Egypt, the feather of truth, or mat, was placed upon one pan of a pair of scales, and on the other pan was placed the heart of the deceased. And the heart was weighed against the eternal law. The mind wasn't weighed, the heart was weighed was weighed, it being assumed that in some instances the mind was not able to carry out the instruction. The mind made many more mistakes than the heart. But if the heart was right, if the individual was really working from the best of his own convictions, this was taken into consideration by the 43 assessors of the dead and determined very largely the future state of that being, whether it would go forth into the fields of a mentat or be swallowed up again into mortality through the body of Typhon. So here the Egyptian uh, causes the heart through a little pair of lips on the side of an urn which represented the heart to cry out to the great God, Eternal Father, permit me not to perish with the king who has ruled for a day. The king who has ruled for a day is the mind. But the heart's rulership is long and old and deep. 
The mind has a new structure each time, but the record in the heart is continuous, and therefore it held a unique place in the wisdom teachings of antiquity. Now let us leave the heart for a moment and give a little thought to the mind in this situation. As, as we say, the Sambodha, or luminous body, of the Buddha or Bodhisattva was represented uh, by the heart. The physical body of the law was represented by the mind, and in this case the mind was personified as the Ahat, the sage, uh, the, the wise one. Uh, in the Vedic lore, uh, the brain itself was represented as Mount Miru, or as some said, uh, the great mountainous caves at the head of the Ganges River, the house of Ganga. From the brain then was presumed to fall the, the river of the spinal cord, uh, which descending finally broke into a number of small filaments uh, fanning out in what uh, is referred to in the Bible as the whip of small cords with which Jesus uh, forced the moneylenders from the porch of the temple. But the river flowing down uh, from the high place represented the nervous system flowing downward from the high place or the brain. In the brain were the ventricles, the caves of the holy men. Here also were the convolutions, which represented the great circles of mountains and hills which occur in the mythological geography of India. The holy men are the regenerated thoughts of man. The Arhat represents the complete integration of the mental nature. He represents the mind which has been purified, transformed, regenerated. He possesses the great virtues, the virtues of steadfastness. He has taken the mental energies and has transformed them into a series of uh, positive or constructive karmic factors. The Arhat, therefore, uh, has a little different relationship in Buddhism, and perhaps we might almost say that the Arhat as the brain or mind factor corresponds with the Southern School. For in the Southern Buddhism, the Arhat or mind, by extinguishing itself, achieves nirvana. In the Northern School, however, the Arhat is only the mind as a servant of or a step toward the Bodhisattva. Because in the Northern System, the individual does not attain Nirvana by the mere extinguishing of thought. He attains it by the achievement of the universal heart consciousness of compassion. So the mind becomes the symbol of an instrument which actually is subordinate to the heart. And as long as the mind remains, as we think of it today, the prime instrument, as long as we think of man as expressing mentally uh, the supremeness of himself, we are going to have the curious misfortunes that have plagued our world since the beginning of recorded history. For the man-governed world in which mind is the governor of both man and the world, is doomed to failure. The reason it is doomed to failure is that mind actually is a very highly evolved computer. The mind is almost as soulless as the computing machine. We do not realize this because our little computer is apparently made of living tissue. And instead of dropping a card out of a slot, or uh, developing certain skills 
to sort cards by means of various electronic factors. Our mind, seemingly, is a living organism. But if it is a living organism, in a sense, it is a computing function by process. This is why it is that man has almost inevitably disassociated mind and virtue. Mind and love have been in conflict since the beginning of all time. And in most instances, man has sacrificed his heart to satisfy his mind. Now, in many instances, mind itself, becoming deeply involved in emotional processes, has taken these processes and created from them negative mental and emotional patterns, which in turn have, in turn have reacted upon the heart disastrously. Thus man, while apparently moving according to his appetites, is actually moving according to the intellectualization of his appetites. The individual who is a sophisticate in his tastes, although his tastes may be aesthetic, has already in intellectualized his tastes, intellectualized his aesthetics, and thereby usually destroyed it. It is very difficult and dangerous for the mind to dabble in the affairs of consciousness because it is simply unable to cope with this problem. The intellect of man has extremely limited boundaries, as science itself knows with its own regret. The mind can do certain things. It, become, it can become more ingenious to infinity. And in the process of becoming more ingenious, it will also create more ingenious devices to infinity. But not one of these devices will have a conscience. Not one of these devices can create. The mind, however, does not recognize creation as the heart does. To the mind, creation is merely the rearrangement of existing factors. Creation is not something new to the mind. It is a new use of things that have previously been known. The mind does not create. The only way in which the mind can be moved creatively is when the heart presents the mind with a problem. And if the mind is honest and serves the heart, then there will be art, then there will be music, then there will be culture. But the mind of itself will not achieve any of these creative processes. One evident fact of the matter is that the mind has to be schooled even before it can function satisfactorily at all. The mind has to be tamed anew in each embodiment through which we pass. And in the processes of training the mind, we have become so aware of our intellectual existence that we have learned to depend upon it for our total being. And this is something that we cannot afford to do. The mind is a useful servant and a heartless taskmaster. A mind linked to purpose, great purpose, can help the individual to achieve that purpose. But the mind linked to the selfish ambitions of an individual can destroy not only himself but his world. And the complete and absolute destruction of the total being. Buddha himself pointed out that this was not true, but Western folks, particularly uh, those of various religious denominations, chose to misunderstand him. The mind, which has therefore been regarded as so extremely noble, is only noble when it is nobly employed. The mind cannot employ itself. The mind cannot decide value. It can only analyze, compare, and try to determine that which is advantageous. The mind does not discover right and wrong. It discovers convenience and inconvenience. 
It does not show the way to the nobility of the being, but it can help him to scheme his way uh, to some lofty spot in the material pattern of life. The mind is essentially a material thing, and the only way in which it can come to life is when it is vitalized by the heart. Now, if we can get these two rather difficult instruments into partnership, we have achieved a great deal. But at this time in our world, to create such a partnership is extremely difficult. We have the individual unable to contact his own heart core. One of the old rules of Rosicrucian manuscripts shows the heart consisting of, a, of an organ uh, enclosing three worlds, three concentric spheres. These represented the layers of the heart, or the levels of heart function. In the very center, of course, was the symbol of the sun, the life giver, which is deeply and eternally enthroned in the heart. Outside of this were the, were the various circles of the conditioned heart life, conditioning which represented the two processes under which the heart is forced to operate. One, the, the desire or the infinite law which says, move life into manifestation. And the other, the finite will of man which says, take life and use it only for the advancement of physical existence. This conflict uh, is a very important thing in trying to understand the levels of heart, because heart does give us also the energy by means of which we remain physically embodied creatures. When the heart gives up, that is the end. And sometimes as we study these problems, we wonder that it does not give up sooner. The mind burdening the heart is responsible for a whole series of mental tensions, mental processes. Here we have a kind of Gnostic emanationism. The moment the mind uh, attains an attitude, it calls upon emotion to vitalize it. And according to the level of the mind energy, so the reacting level of the heart energy will be. If, therefore, uh, the mind works out an evil conspiracy, the outer structure of the emotional nature of the heart must thereby sustain this conspiracy. The mind says, I do not want to like this, like this person. So immediately the emotional nature moves in and says, I want to feel hate for this creature. If the mind hadn't started it, the heart would never have followed it. But once the mind draws these patterns, the heart energy or life energy has to vitalize them. And whenever the heart energy vitalizes a negative mental pattern, this pattern becomes a living thing. And from a mental attitude of criticism will then come a great emotional surge of dislike. With this emotional surge will come bitterness, will come cruelty, will come almost a complete savage indifference to integrities of any kind. Feeling takes over as the negative pole of the heart process. And this feeling becomes, in a sense, the slave of mental purpose. The mind is nearly always involved some way in a conspiracy where it forces the heart into a negative relationship. The individual who has wrong uh, emotional conditions has passed through a process of false rationalizations. A good example of that is the individual who over a long period of time 
him develops an acute self-pity. Now this self-pity does not come from the heart. This self-pity comes from an individual being mentally sorry for himself over a long period of time. It means that the mind has very carefully and continuously overlooked or failed to rationalize anything good that occurred to that person. That the mind has distorted the relationship of that person to others around him. The mind has thrown the personality against life rather than into harmony with it. And once the person has lived under the conspiracy of the mind long enough, we have a good solid case of self-pity, which is now open to emotionalization, and the individual dissolves in his own miseries. But he does not start by being miserable in his heart. He starts with a series of very shrewd mental patterns. And in nearly every instance, these mental patterns arose in ambition, selfishness, self-justification, egotism, or, or perhaps actually a kind of inefficiency which made it impossible for this person to compete effectively with other persons. His dislike for life itself, his growing emotional adolescent unhappiness has been due to the fact that he has allowed the mind to distort his estimation of himself. The same is true of the hypochondriac. The hypochondriac is not an individual whose fear arises in his heart. His so-called fear began as a series of bad attitudes toward life, towards things. His fear was an intellectual fear. One of the most common of these hypochondriac problems is an individual who has had some kind of a minor heart ailment. It's much more likely to arise with persons who have had minor or moderate heart ailments than those who have really had bad ones because the bad ones have more or less made their peace with God and man already. But the ones that are just mostly not very sick become our pulse takers. They cannot get their minds off of the possibility that their heart will stop beating. They are totally unaware of the fact that if it ever did stop beating, they would have no time to take their pulse. But this... Uh, <laughs> The individual who reaches in to feel his pulse to find out if he's still alive is one of the most foolish persons on earth. <laughs> but there are a lot of people who do it. Simply because the mind is presenting them constantly with a certain mental doubt. The mind has given them this whole picture. And after a while, the mind gives way to the emotional stress which it has caused. And the individual begins using his emotions badly, and if he does this long enough, and he does have some kind of an ailment, his recovery will be slow, if at all possible. He simply is misusing these powers. The heart has no dislike for the mind, but the heart is the builder. The mind is a workman. By using the mind, the heart would like to bring mankind together in peace, but the mind will not permit it. As Jesus said that he would like to take the people of Jerusalem to himself as the hen puts her chicks under her wing, but they would not. The heart sees, senses, knows the incredible beauty that is possible, and the mind settles down to talking the individual out of it. The heart says there can be peace. The mind says, no, I can prove to you there can't. And after a while, the heart gives up, but very reluctantly. 
And even if for a long time the heart is defeated, at the first little glimmer of proof that there might be peace, the heart wakes up and reaffirms its own conviction. The heart's nobilities never die. They are simply blocked by debate. And uh, as we know in law, as we know in legislation, as we know in committee, we have nothing accomplished. It takes a dozen persons ten times as long to work out a problem as one individual would require to do it by himself. It means confusion, and with over 40 faculties of the mind in constant debate over the possibility of something, situations get just about as bad as we see them in modern society. Nations against nations. Uh, men coming together to work for peace but each one instructed to put his own ulterior motives first. Now this is the problem in the mind. The mind, first of all, is more directly geared to externals than the heart. The heart has never been able to see a great civilization built on love. Men are able to see, however, a very powerful structure built on mind. Mind can see itself reflected in its own productions, the great skyscraper, the wonderful bridge, all of the scientific researches, men in orbit, and the, and the mind has a very strong case for its own importance. And the heart has very little to offer. The heart's place in this situation today is about as active as that of religion in relation to science. Science is on horseback. The mind is leading. No one knows where it is leading. No one has, is able to say that it will get there. But in the last ten years, one thing is obvious. The mind has become more and more autocratic at this stage in our civilization, having been given complete authority, which has never previously occurred in history. The mind has taken this authority very much in the spirit of a politician delighted to find that his constituents will are behind him no matter what he does. This is what every politician has dreamed of. So the mind, having found that it is catered to, honored, given every preference, um, be, uh, given all gratitude and uh, reward for everything that happens, and knowing that it will never be questioned in this particular generation, has gone power crazy. It, is, it begins to think of itself, and the person who possesses the mind thinks of himself, as a unique child of destiny and that mind is going to solve everything. Mind has solved nothing. Mind has given us certain physical standards of living, which we are all going to die and leave behind. But mind has not solved any of the great problems of humanity, because it cannot solve them. It is a problem maker, not a problem solver. The only thing that can touch the situation is a transmutation, a transformation, uh, a transubstantiation, as it was in the old Christian religion, in which the symbols by ritual are transformed into the living truths which they represent. This is transubstantiation. The great advancements of science, the great accomplishments of mind, must become the symbols upon which a great alchemy will have to take place, and that is the transforming, the transmutation of these symbols into the truths for which they are the Im images or emblems. And this can only be done by life, and life is a heart power. 
Life must be breathed into these things or they are inert. No one would really dare to assume that a city of skyscrapers is actually alive as far as its buildings are concerned. The only thing that makes the city alive can be the people that live in that city. The city itself as a physical structure is not alive. Therefore, all the works that men have done of themselves are not alive. And in some way, they have to be transformed into living things. And how do we transform a great scientific project into a living thing? We transform it by heart. We transform it when heart achieves leadership and dedicates this structure to purpose. This structure becomes a servant of life when it has received what the Buddhist calls the ritual of the opening of its eyes. And the opening of its eyes means that into this structure is placed a holy relic, it is placed a dedicated truth of power by means of which that which is of itself inanimate becomes in a mysterious way and sold by purpose. Nothing that we create mentally is of real value unless it is ensouled by purpose. The man whom we train to become a great lawyer is not a great lawyer because he is an excellent jurist. He is only a great lawyer when he is ensouled by the purpose to which he is to use his skill. Unless he is dedicated, he is not great, regardless of what he achieves. Unless the city is dedicated, it is not a great city. Unless a nation is dedicated, it can never remain a great nation. Now, there are different levels of dedication. Some are right and some are wrong. We can say this. That which has no dedication is the shortest lived of all. That which has a wrong dedication but is still dedicated lives a longer time. And that which is completely ensouled by a true dedication may be regarded as immortal. So it is, this, it is the heart bestowing life that gives life to forms, to gives life to institutions, gives life to trades and arts and crafts. And in giving life, the heart also produces another wonder. In giving life to trades and professions and arts and crafts, the heart gives life to the tradesman, the artisan, and the craftsman, because it is heart that makes him happy in his work. It is heart which binds his consciousness to his job. It is heart which makes him undergo privation for the sake of something beyond himself. The individual who has nothing to live for but himself is the most bankrupt of all. It is always dedication to something that makes life valuable. Dedication to the world, dedication to family, dedication to the advancement of some noble cause. Only this dedication, which is bestowed by the heart, can make the works of the mind and hand a medicine for the person who labors. Thus, as we hear all the arguments and dissensions, as we find less and less of the joy of labor for the integrities involved, we will have more strikes, more problems, more difficulties, until the various factions will devour civilization in the effort to feed themselves. This is mind. This is mind going on, thinking only of how much it can get, how little it can give. The moment the heart steps in, however, this whole process is changed. And in philosophy, we have this great need 
to realize that philosophy is finally not an intellectual pursuit. The philosophy that has not been ensouled is the typical academic philosophy in which the professor teaches what he has been taught to others who wait hopefully to receive his instruction. Nobody knows, nobody lives any part of it, and nobody cares. Philosophies are systems to be remembered, and if you answer the right way the questions that are asked, you will graduate from the course. This is the problem. This is mental philosophy. The same problem is mental science, uh, where the, the scientist is concerned totally with the advancement of knowledge. Every new discovery is a great mental thrill. But the use of these things, the dedication of them, the uh, self-control which may cause the scientist to say, I will not reveal this because it is too dangerous to other men. This attitude must come in the place of, I will reveal it because it will give glory to myself. These attitudes have to be changed. Philosophy, in order to be meaningful, has to be touched by the heart. It has to become a way of consciousness in which knowledge is used to support the convictions of the heart. The heart is the seed of faith, and it is the mind by means of which faith is justified, and all things that men desire to achieve because of love are made possible because of the skills of the mind. Mind is therefore apprenticed to a power greater than itself. When this occurs, the individual is mentally happy. He is mentally ordered. His life is purposed. Everything which he does gives certain natural, reasonable, proper satisfactions to himself. He is not overambitious, nor is he lacking in that consciousness which causes him to labor on industriously for some good beyond profit to himself. The world has always known this. The world has always neglected this phase of knowledge, and civilization after civilization has collapsed as the result always of the victory of intellectual selfishness over integrity. Now, the mind in its own nature, according to the Buddhistic system, has to be refined in various ways. The mind has to be gradually relaxed away from the tremendous nervous momentum which it has built up. The great mystery of the mind is centered in the punishments that it bestows upon and receives from the nervous system. The nervous system is, like the mind itself, a curiously habit-bound structure. When certain habits have been built, the mind of itself does not apparently have the skill to break them. When an individual decides that he is under nervous tension and builds up enough of it, he finds that even when he wishes to relax, he cannot. So having gradually worked himself up into a highly nervous and almost dangerously tense situation, he knows no way to cope with it except through some form of sedational drugs. He has no other way. He cannot untangle himself. This is all its own way should tell man the, the misery of his own condition. He should realize that if the mind cannot get him out of the immediate difficulty it has got him into, that it is hardly an infallible process in himself. But when the time comes for this infallibility problem to show itself, the person finds some evasion or just does not think it through. If the mind is what we hope it is, it should be able to regulate the conduct of its own owner. 
it should be able to convince him of what is good for him. Instead of that, it leaves him the hopeless victim of what is bad for him. So we do realize that the mind building up these stress tension processes has no autocorrective unless some actually valid system comes under consideration. Now in Zen, for example, uh, the uh, thoughtful uh, exponent of this rather dramatic form of Eastern philosophy hit upon an almost fantastic idea, and that is the use of the mind to defeat itself. That the mind, as long as it actually was merely a machine for thinking, if the proper data is fed into it, if the proper patterns are set up in the computing process, the correct answer should fall out of the slot. If, therefore, the mind of man, under discipline, receives certain facts, and these facts are passed through this computing process of the five senses and the coordinator, the individual should ultimately wake up one morning and say to himself, I'm stupid. <laughs> this, incidentally, is the only answer he can get, no matter who he is or what he is. If he already knows this, he won't ask the question. He's too wise. If he doesn't know enough to know that he is inadequate, then this is the answer he must inevitably get. He must, therefore, use or sense the possibility of using the mental processes to expose their own weakness. Now, nature has done this also. Incidentally, this procedure, which is technically Zen, is actually a part of what we might term social existence. Actually, everywhere in human society, mistakes have been used to disprove themselves. They disprove themselves by simply failing to work. The situation building up on wrong foundations and remaining uncorrected and continuing to build and compound its own felonies, the thing finally falls apart revealing itself to have been worthless from the beginning. By this time, of course, the human beings are looking in another direction, hopefully, and do not see the rubbish that is left behind. But it is true in nature and true in man that the mind is relentlessly, subjectively engaged in the process of disproving itself, because that is all it can ever do. If it goes deeply enough, the only answer that can come out of it is that it is inadequate. That of itself it cannot do these things. It is like the individual who tries to be an atheist. The atheist is a person who, with his own sophistication, with his own mental attitudes, with his own rationalizations, has deprived himself of the emotional strength of faith. He can do this for a certain length of time, but under emergencies, he will ultimately discover that he has de deprived himself of an absolutely necessary strength, and he will finally either collapse or go back to his faith. He cannot escape it. The mind cannot bring him to the goal he seeks, even though he may remain an atheist to the day he dies. He simply dies not as well as he would otherwise have died, and his future is less certain, at least less immediately secure for him. So in the Zen theory and in Buddhism generally, the concept is to use the mind to, we will say, recover from the illusion of mentality, to let the mind become increasingly aware of its mistakes. 
wouldn't take long to make up quite a dossier on them at the present moment in world politics. It wouldn't be much of a problem to make quite a collection of valuable notes bearing to uh, bearing upon the disaster of the intellectualizing of religion by means of which a faith was broken up into a number of creeds that have never been able to get along with each other. The creeds are the product of the mind. The faith was the substance of the heart. And it is surprising how one faith, which underlies nearly all human believing, can by the mind be arbitrarily divided into hundreds of conflicting creeds, all of which affirm the same thing. So we have the heart, which is a unifying force, constantly struggling against the dissecting uh, factor of mentality. So the uh, Zen and some of the others, rather in area, rather like the Wabi quality, as they call it, it's the quality of humbleness, the quality of things very fragile that call upon our sympathy more rapidly than upon our thought. The great work of the great master is intellectually appreciated, perhaps, but some simple thing, like the child's pet, is wabi. It touches our hearts instead. It makes us first warm, and then perhaps we contemplate the details. But where the details come first and are analyzed, dissected, broken up, there will never be any hour of warmth followed. You notice the musician, uh, the, the music lover, sitting in the inexpensive seats at the back of a great music hall great to, uh, while a great orchestra plays. Almost inevitably, that person will close his eyes. He will shut out visions. He will shut out the eye symbolism, the symbolism of distraction. He doesn't want to watch all the, mu the violinists sawing away on their instruments. He doesn't want to see the conductor waving his baton about. He doesn't want to observe the lady in the front row fanning herself out of rhythm. He doesn't want to see these things. He wants to close out the world and be aware of the spirit of great music. In a sense also, in mysticism, in Zen, and in other forms of Eastern philosophy, the closing of the eyes becomes a symbol of the closing of the material perceptions in order to permit the soul itself to live without the contaminating influence of being constantly aware of the mental act attitudes of men. We will close our eyes, the world of men disappears. We, and if we, while closing our eyes, open our hearts, the world of God appears. And without this world of God, the world of man does not amount to very much. And when we get this inner sight, this inner uh, tremendous sense of value, then we see how this world of men could be something marvelous, something wonderful, something beautiful. We begin to get the vision of the new Jerusalem, or the mystery of the second coming of the Messiah, or something of that nature we suddenly are aware that behind the mysterious confusions and complexes and web works and snarls which men have fashioned, there is always this sublimity of the world to be experienced only as a great beauty, an almost painful beauty to be accepted into the heart, a heart that becomes so still by overwhelming that it can really be still and know the presence of God. Now, the mind is not to discard it in Northern Buddhism. The Arhats do not continue on their lonely paths to liberation. But the fact remains now that the mind in Northern Buddhism has to be civilized. It has to be transformed into a servant of truth. The moment it becomes a servant of truth, your polarities cease. As in all cases, your polarities are illusions. 
There is really no essential difference in cosmic substance between these various vibrations that in man break up into such distinct patterns. The wonderful friendship of the mind and heart are perhaps, uh, is perhaps best indicated in the symbolism, the psychic symbolism of the anima and the animus. Here we have the great polarization in nature, male and female, mind and heart. And we notice that wherever in society mind and heart lock in a particular crisis, we almost immediately observe a rise in broken homes. We find selfishness intensifying in families. The moment there cannot be sympathies, there will be antipathies. The moment individuals insist upon rationalizing the basic values of life, they destroy them. There is no way of defining the natural affections of man. They can only be experienced. When we analyze them, break them down, try to psychologically put them in little pockets, we have destroyed them. The moment we try to explain why we love or why we do not love, we have lost all value. We have simply become intellectualists. But as man loses the inner directives to build a great world, he loses almost immediately uh, the integrity of his personal affections. Something happens between him and those who are very near to him. Uh, the tyrant who will destroy the world will also destroy his own family, his own home. Overambition will kill the love in a family. It will result in neglected children who turn against their parents. The moment value ceases, the moment things are put onto mental levels, the moment the individual sits down with his little notebook and says, well, if it all goes well, in five years and two months we'll be able to put in the swimming pool. Now that's all work for this. The whole problem is intellectualized. Life is gone out of that problem. The real problem is not how long it will take us to have things. The real problem is to keep alive the tremendous integrity of the complete joy, the complete fullness of immediate personal sympathy, personal understanding, personal kindness. And as we find civilizations drifting away, as men drift into materialism, as governments drift into misunderstandings, as society drifts into competitive patterns, as we have more disputes and more difficulties and more agitations in every area of society, we find these things become absolutely ridiculously involved. We find today, for example, that there is someone ready at any minute to argue with anyone. All you have to do is express an opinion, and a person who knows nothing about it will immediately contradict you. If you are in any position, if you advance a law in the nation, it will be opposed instantly. If you attempt any constructive legislation, it will be opposed instantly. If you try to even be a good citizen, someone will accuse you of not being a good citizen. Because all these people, fear-ridden, hate-ridden, uh, selfishness-ridden, ridden by a false sense of what is liberty and what is right, not recognizing the difference between just laws and tyrannies, not recognizing the difference between necessary controls and unnecessary controls. These people are simply intellectualizing themselves into hatreds, into discords, into miseries, by the simple process of using their own minds to condemn the works of every other human mind. This process goes on, we're going to have a very sick world. And it's not going to be sick because it had to be sick. 
It's going to be sick because the individual does not realize or has no way, apparently, of knowing about his, his own nature. He does not know that the throne of his life, the source of his life, the one thing which is the ever-flowing fountain of his happiness, his survival, his immortality, and actually through him, the great stream of progress, which is for the healing of the nations, that this is his own heart. That when his heart speaks quietly, simply, in those natural ways which are proper and are not distorted by ulterior motives or efforts at self-justification or the nursing of grievances and grudges, if the heart can speak, the heart will speak gently. The heart will always speak from its inevitable love instinct. In catastrophe, our neighbors' houses washed away or burned down, instantly we become human. We're going to do everything we can for that person. He builds his house back again, puts a fence up, and we never speak to each other again. The need brought out the heart. This is Wabi. Our neighbor was not in need when he had everything, but as he stood hungry in his yard with his children, Suddenly, our heart went out to him, a great sympathy. We had something within ourselves that said, we want to help this person because we sense suffering, we sense poverty, we sense emergency, we sense pain, and our natural instinct is to bring balm to Gilead. So we try to help, and we never expect to be paid for this kind of help. But as soon as things get back into their good old intellectual ruts, we go back to our preoccupations and we are strangers again. But always in man is this heart reaching out to meet the need of life. For the heart wants to love. It wants to serve. It wants to be parent. It wants to respect. It wants uh, to adore something that is great and noble. When this is missing, it will, de it will deflect its emotions to some unworthy and stupid end. The individual who does not find great things to love uh, will turn his emotional attachment uh, to the most inadequate things. But he must have some outlet, and he must have a good outlet. So the heart by leading the mind and souls it makes it purposeful. The mind dedicating itself like the sword of the crusader before the temple altar of his God. The mind dedicated to the service of the heart waits quietly in the sanctum sanctorum to receive the message of the day written by the living finger of God upon the tablets of the heart. Here in the heart is the oracle, and it is our privilege to serve that. But before it can function, we must relax away from the negative and destructive thoughts which cause us to misunderstand our own hearts. And we must relax away from those emotional tensions and pressures that cause us to misunderstand our own emotions. These are the false superficial levels of things. And it is only when we are at peace for a moment that the mind discovers how blessed it is to be at rest. And the heart says or discovers how blessed it is to adore the Creator and to remember the Creator in the days of our youth and to remember always the wonderful workings of the infinite power which has fashioned all things with love, and then has put a mind in the garden as a gardener. The gardener was not true. The mind became the tempting serpent. And from this temptation, man ate of the tree of knowledge, and he has never been happy since. 
but it is possible for the individual to rededicate himself as a good gardener, to use the mind for what it was intended, namely, to make immediately possible the perfect working of the law, that through the mind we shall reveal the ways and means to glorify truth, to bring truth in its interpretations into our lives. The purpose of the mind is to find applications for principles, not to deny these principles, destroy them, or misuse them, but to find the best uses for the great energies of life, and then, with all dedication, serve these usages, advance them, fulfill them, not for the glory of man, but for the greater glory of the law. If we can understand this, we can create a working partnership where now we have a very terrible feud between management and labor, between all the polarities of life, which we must solve by having orators get up and harangue us. Haranguing, harangue us as Hitler harangued Germany, as Mussolini harangued Italy, as Stalin harangued Russia. And out of all of this haranguing and debating and discussing came only death into the world. So we don't need these things. We don't need to have our minds trained in fanaticisms or to propaganda. What we need is that our minds should be used to glorify the good in our own hearts to reveal the love that we have and to find a thousand ingenious ways to bring love to others and thus contribute to their happiness and well-being. It can be a wonderful team, but it hasn't been getting along so well in recent years. It never has gotten along perfectly. But we are wise enough today and old enough in sorrow and experience to do a better job than we have so far. And I hope that each person will try to do just a little better job each day in rescuing love from intellection, rescuing the heart from prejudice, from intolerance, and from all of these things that disfigure man, sicken him. And when the heart gets psychically sick, one of these days it's just going to stop. And the individual who has broken all the rules will inevitably be broken by the rules that he has broken. And we can make a wonderful partnership with life, or we can simply strengthen our partnership with death. If the mind and heart work together, they perfect man. They give him the inner life that makes his hands useful. If they work to cross purposes, man is nervous, irritable, sick, disillusioned, and unhappy. No one can correct this problem but the individual himself. But if he does not correct it, he is endangering not only his inner life, but also his daily existence in this world. Well, time is up, and we thank you very much for being with us.